organizadora da décima semana de geologia. Então, sejam bem-vindos e uma ótima palestra. Agora eu vou passar a, pa a palavra para Ana. Boa noite, senhores. Meu nome é Ana Paula e eu vou falar um pouco a respeito do professor palestrante. É, o senhor Jacob Fossen é um estruturalista internacionalmente reconhecido, graduado em geologia na Universidade de Bergen, na Noruega. Ele é especializado em geologia estrutural, também na Universidade de Bergen e na Universidade de Minnesota, nos Estados Unidos. Ele é atualmente professor dessa área desde 1997 na Universidade de Bergen e participa de linhas de pesquisa por todo o mundo, como os doutoramentos caledolianos no norte da Europa e o sistema, orogênico, é, o sistema orogênico da Mantiqueira no Brasil. Ele publicou o livro Geologia Estrutural, traduzido em duas línguas a partir do inglês, e livro-texto de vários cursos de Geologia Estrutural. É, o Sr. Fossen também tem várias publicações de artigos científicos em vários veículos científicos, científicos, além de orientar diversos estudantes em seus projetos de pesquisa. A palestra dele é Historical Aspects of Structural Geology. Senhores, please, Mr. Fossen. Obrigado. Boa noite para todos. Eu não falo muito português. So I will continue in English. <laughs> um, I, uh, my voice is very poor today. I, I woke up with a cold. So I hope you can, uh, can hear. The microphone seems to be good. So I hope, I hope that's uh, okay. I'm just going to talk a little bit so that you get used to my, my voice and accent and everything. So yes, I'm very happy to be in Brazil and here in the... Uh, Belo Horizonte. It's, uh, it's, it's, nothing is better than visiting students and seeing a big group of students like this is, is very, very nice. Uh, this is probably the most important audience that we professors can, can talk to. And we talk, of course, we talk to students a lot, so that's, that's, that's great. I was, um, I'm going to talk about shear zones tomorrow. Today, I was, I was asked to say something about historical aspects of the structural geology. So I'm going to do that. I have quite a few slides, so let's see. When you leave, I will stop, I guess. <laughs> let's see how this works. Okay, structural geology is uh, similar to any, almost any branch of, of geology. It's all about fascination and curiosity and uh, that was the case for the old guys Leonardo da Vinci, Steno, Hutton, Charles Darwin, many many more all of these people they were driven by their fascination of geology um, and this should be the driving force for for us too for me and for you Uh, early geologists also had a very wide field of interest. They were interested in many, many things. Um, there was no clear boundary between structural geology and other geologic disciplines. So, Structural geology in many universities was actually not established as a specific separate subject until the 60s maybe so it's relatively young as as a subject so the pioneers specialization is something that has uh, happened since the days of the pioneers life is short and specialization is necessary but we have to lift our heads and look around and see what's going on around us in different fields as structural geologists this because good ideas can come from different fields within geology and sometimes even outside so make sure you you use you look around and don't get too buried in your specializations okay the pioneers i just put some pictures and names and the first ones like i said are not specifically structural geologists, but they were also interested in that. 
if we go all the way back to about year 1000, Avicenna was a guy somewhere in the Middle East who explained the mountains, tried to explain mountains in his book of healing. It doesn't sound like a geology book. Um, don't know much about it, but apparently he tried to explain mountains as the effect of uh, earthquakes and erosion. So that was, a, that was the first kind of, maybe more tectonics than structural geology. And then we got people like Nicholas Steno. He was not the father of structural geology, but of stratigraphy, unfortunately. But he made this kind of statement that layers that are tilted have to be, have been deformed in the past. So he gave some clues and talked a little bit about deformation in that sense. Hutton, Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell <coughs> was uh, trying to explain earthquakes as well, which is related to structural geology. And then there is a lot of other people. You can make a long, long list of later structural geologists or geologists working on structural geology. Okay. So, <clears throat> what is it about structural geology that fascinates you? For me, there is two things in general, very general terms. Of course, there are, there are specific areas and things, but two things. One is just the beauty of structures, looking at nice outcrops, seeing uh, folds and faults and things. Uh, is, is just beautiful and it, it's kind of inviting to study these structures. And then the other thing, which is this kind of question that comes naturally from the first one, uh, what processes form these structures? It creates curiosity. So these uh, two elements were also in the minds of early geologists. Let's just show some pictures of beautiful places I've been. This is uh, part of a monocline, a fold, uh, in, in the Colorado Plateau, very big. These are small folds, uh, folding a myelinitic foliation in a thrust nap in, in Scandinavia. This is actually the place where I for the first English edition of my book. In Switzerland, beautiful big folds, very nice. And this is from uh, Rio de Janeiro in uh, near Parachi. Beautiful folds. Uh, press the wrong button, see what happens. Okay. The best place to, to to, um, to look at structures is, of course, in the field. I mean, you can look at structures, pictures, and but going in the field is, is really the best thing that we as structural geologists can, can do to, to get inspiration and, and, and ideas as well. So it's a good place to start wondering about the origin of structures. And we do that in the field. This is a group of petroleum geologists who spend most of their lives in, uh, in an office and they get very happy when they get out to look at faults and uh, structures in, in the field. In the lab, we also do in the lab, we can get very good ideas in front of the computer. We study structural geology. We wake up in the middle of the night not being able to sleep because we are so into Problems and structure is amazing. I know, I know what this is like. Uh, okay. So, 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 so this is kind of my life to some extent. Um, we think about the pioneers, the early structural geologists, as people who were just describing structures. They were measuring strike and dip, and maybe plotting and some things but mostly describing. Today we are much better, but, but it's not, this is not true. Some did that, some did only that, but 
the true geoscientists of the past also had these um, uh, we were concerned with the, the, the processes that formed the structures from the very beginning. And this is expressed in their publications and from the fact that they carried out physical experiments. <clears throat> physical experiments was... Oh, that was that one. Physical experiments was um, carried out since the beginning. We'll come back to that. Okay. In the beginning, they didn't have a lot of tools. Strike and dip was actually uh, measured by a compass as early as 1505, from what I could find. A compass with a clinometer was constructed at about 1800, so at least they had a good compass to measure things. And the early geology was typically related to the mining industry in the uh, um, I guess both here and in, in Europe. Uh, we got the first geologic map and cross-section of a nation in 1815 with uh, dipping layers. Here is the earliest compass that I could find um, on the uh, in a paper that I was reading about the early geologists. So it has, it measures actually Strike and dip, or dip actually measures dip direction and dip um, in just by putting the compass onto the, the rock. This is from 1814, so that then they could start to make the first kind of rose diagrams, 1864, and the strike and dip symbols were found on maps in the 18th century. Okay. Yeah, we already did that. No, hit that stupid button again. Let's see. There we go. Um, the other thing they did was to make sketches and drawings. This is from Charles Lyell. This one is by Albert Heim, uh, Austrian geologist, structural geologist mostly. And this is very important because making sketches was helping them to to identify, to observe what, what exactly was going on in the, the outcrop or the, the, the exposure. And this is equally important today. If people had done more sketching, careful sketching, I think some of the uh, discoveries would have been made earlier in some, some cases. This is, this is a sketch by, from the field book of the French Geologist uh, Jacques uh, Anchelier. Uh, this is this is one of my students from a field trip. So it's equally important today. There are some there are some beautiful sketches. This is um, David Peacock's from about 2000. I don't remember exactly. Very nice sketches of faults and figures too. We have we have all kinds of. Um, of, of 3D graphic tools and things, but just being able to draw a figure is still important because it makes you think. Every line you put in there, you have to think. It's not like a, a program produces everything for you. So this one by uh, Kockenberg et al. 2011. Okay, so that's a little bit about, about um, sketching and early geologists. I want to, uh, I made a timeline. I made two timelines from about 1800 till today. One is about tools and techniques mostly. And the other is more, has more focus on discoveries and breakthroughs, okay? So, um, let's see, let's do the tools first. It's a little bit difficult to read, but we already talked about hammer, field book, map, and compass. That was the tools in the earliest days. Then about 1815, we, not we, I wasn't there, uh, none of us were, people started to make thin sections and microscope, the polarizing microscope was available. And uh, there's probably more thing you can put in here, 
but we got early seismic data here. This is 1910, something like that. We get the U stage, universal stage. I'll come back to that if you don't know what that is. Um, we started to use stereo net and a little bit later, equal area projections, first for minerals, but then also for structures, foliations, and lineations. Um, let's see, 1950, rock deformation labs, which is squeezing rocks in, in machines, putting stress on the rocks was, was um, there were people very active on that, around 1950, 60, and people still are. We got better seismic data and grav gravity and magnetic data was being collected in much more better data than before. We got computer, PC. We have now relatively good radiometric dating methods. So this is now in the 60s, 70s, and, and later. With a lot more and more uh, ways of dating rocks and minerals, and later also deformation, indirectly or directly. <clears throat> seismic 2D data was replaced by seismic 3D data. And seismic 3D data is amazing. You can see things in three dimensions in, in a very nice way, if you have good data. You can map structures in a way that's impossible in the field. Okay, EBSD, I will come back to that. And then we have something called Google Earth, which is amazing, very easily accessible for everybody, but really a very, very important tool to, structure, to um, structural geologists, students and professors, and all the digital field mapping. So that's, that's uh, uh, an evolution. You can see there's a lot of things happening from 1950 and onwards. Um, if we, if we start, yeah, this one shouldn't really be there. If we start on the other side, we have around 1800 starting to see physical experiments being, being made. Now we have the discussion about slaty cleavage in the later 1800s. We have the controversy about thrusting. Is thrusting really possible? Thrust naps. We'll come back to that. Uh, strain was being treated in a more, a little bit more sophisticated way. Uh, we got the plate tectonics, we know, let me see, in 1950, 60, continental drift and plate tectonics. No, this is 19, oh no, yeah, this is 1915 uh, or something like that. Continental drift, Wagner, Wagner, sorry. And we got something that, was called kinematic axes that was very important in structural geology. It was very common. It wasn't very useful, but it was very, um, very common to talk about kinematic axes. So there was a guy called Sander. We'll come back to that too. Okay, 1950s, just before and after that, we have the era of petrofabric diagrams that no one understood. Fold theory was developing in the 1960s and onwards. Fold geometry, strain, big things in the 60s. And then progressive deformation, plate tectonics was finalized, more or less. We had a much better understanding of shear zones in uh, about 1970. And onwards, myelinite and fault rocks were much better understood. Restoration of sections and maps, paleo stress methods. Extension of tectonics was big in the 80s. Kinematic indicators, there was a lot of things going on here. Transpression, progressive deformation complications, blah, blah, blah. That was very, very, very active. Let me see, so I actually, subdivided this into an early period, a century of the 
pioneers. They made a lot of good observations, did some experiments, had good ideas. And then I'm a little bit uh, nasty because I call the next 50 years, 50 years of important confusion. Okay, it doesn't sound good. But it was important because when you go through these phases of confusion, you usually end up with something useful. And it was like there was a new birth of structural geology in the 50s, from the mid 50s, maybe 60, 1960, something like that, where people were actually making great progress, understanding folds and myelinites and, and kinematic indicators and all kinds of things. So that's when modern structural geology was established in the 60s and the 70s. 70s was amazing. And then we have uh, the digital era. I had, to put, I had to put the name on the last one too. There's that, so we'll see what that ends up with. But there is a lot of digital maps, digital satellite images, the digital seismic data and so on that is important. So that's my way of subdividing these things, having gone through everything. So fortunately, we are not in the 50 years of confusion. We, are, we have a very strong foundation to, to build on. I thought I, since I wrote the textbook, I thought I mentioned textbooks too. There's actually uh, quite a few textbooks in structural geology. And I'm sure there's one or two that I didn't think of when I made this overview. But the first one that I could find was from 1913. It's called Structural Geology. Um, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to define a text, but what is a textbook and what is more a more thematic book. But 1913 seems to be the first structural geology textbook, as far as I can could see. And this Sanders book was kind of a little bit specialized, not exactly a textbook. And we've got Hills, uh, Billings, The Sitter, blah, blah, blah. There's 25, 6, 7 different structural geology textbooks made over the last uh, 100 years, more or less. I have, if you plot these in a histogram, as you have the data, we see that there is, of course, many more structural geology textbooks. Actually, most there's quite a few from the 60s, and then there's quite a few from these 80s and 90s. If we add the the second and third editions, we we get um, a schoolness schoolness like this. The the peak is kind of over here. But this, this tells us what, of course, that there's more and more people interested in structural geology, obviously. More and more textbooks, and if we had made similar um, histograms or graphs for papers, the amount of papers published in structural geology, it would be, uh, it would be a, an exponential curve. One of the important things that happened, I said that the 70s was really really cool time for a structural geology with many new techniques and discoveries. One of the interesting things, important things that happened in 1979 was that the Journal of Structural Geology was established. So that was, that was, we got our own journal and there were a lot of very good structural geology papers published in that journal and there still is. Okay, physical experiments. These early guys, the early structural geologists, see, geologists, they had, they, they saw the structures, but they wondered how they formed, like I said. And they immediately tried to make physical experiments to see if they can reproduce these structures and try to explain how they formed. 
Okay, let's see. Physical experiments. The first one that is usually mentioned in this, uh, this connection is James Hall. This is um, um, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, sorry. Time flies. It's 200 years ago. And uh, 200 years ago, he, he put a, a pile of textiles, fabric, I mean, you can you can do experiments with uh, almost anything. You can use do experiments with your own clothes, and that's what he did. Put the pile of clothes, and shortened this pile, and made very nice folds. And then he used clay as another material. Uh, before that, they also did experiments, but then they did stretching experiments. What happened in the 18th century? They went away from this barbaric way of doing experiments, they, they, they made contraction mostly. Okay, so that's historical perspective. Uh, through the 1800s, more and more experiments were made. <clears throat> In this case, this actually illustrates very nicely what's, what's called boundary conditions. What, what's around the thing that you are deforming is very important. And this is something that they didn't didn't care enough about, but in this case, he, this guy, um, Lyle, he put a book on top of the, I think this is textiles, so that you have some kind of overburden, right? So they're starting to think uh, about the, the surroundings, the, the setting. This guy did not really, I mean, this is just a metal a beam that he, um, he, um, shortens, but it's quite interesting. This is from 1879, and this, this beam of the metal thing is thicker in this end, and it gets thinner to the right. And we know that from fold theory that developed in, well, 100 years later almost. But there is a relationship between the thickness of the layer and the wavelength. We have thin layers and you get a shorter wavelength, tighter folds, right? So that was, that was uh, quite, quite a good experiment, 1879. This one is a guy who made, uh, it's probably clay, I'm not sure. He made shortening experiments, and look at this, uh, the curved layers here. This is what do we call drag oftentimes um, and he made this and he could and that's a good thing about experiments you can see how things develop so he made what was later called fault oops fault propagation folds the fault propagation folds is this one one of my 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 uh, my um, animations showing how a fault moves through a sequence of layers uh, with folding uh, in front of the fault tip. And this is a fault propagation fold, and then the fault cuts through the layers, cut through the, fo the fold, and form drag. So this was already um, investigated in 1879, and then it was kind of forgotten, it seems, until the 60s and 70s. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> they also they also modeled orogenic wedges. Um, this is an experiment by Forsheimer, Forsch 1883. Uh, let's see. I will show you an experiment from 10 years ago. That is one of the uh, Jacques Malaviel's experiments. Look at how similar the structures are that he forms in the highly sophisticated lab in Montpellier. Very similar to these structures. So they were able to make very similar, very good structures, to use that word. The problem was that they didn't have cameras and and film cameras to, to record the evolution, 
and uh, they messed up the boundary conditions sometimes. But it's quite impressive how they were already making very um, um, models that were very similar to the ones that that we make today to understand, in this case, an organic wedge. In this case, there is erosion going on on the top. He didn't do that, but he could have. It's very, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to do experiments. You should, you should do that, whatever you use. Uh, some experiments here, it's shortening. This is plaster gypsum. And you make a thrust fault and make another one. And you make another one soon over here. Let's see. Right, very simple. But you can observe a lot of things. You can observe that the spacing between these blocks is fairly constant. That must mean something. Let's look at another one. Uh, okay. In this case, we get reverse antithetic faults before the main thrust forms. So the thing is, you can you can study how these structures form from the beginning to the end. It's a lot of fun. It's not it's not high flying science, but it's a way to make your brain think and to get ideas. And then you can test it with more sophisticated methods if you want to. Okay. Experiments are fun. Cleavage. There's many types of cleavage. I will uh, focus on uh, a kind of cleavage called slaty cleavage. This was a big problem to early structural geologists. What, what is cleavage? How does cleavage form? What exactly is that? Because there's just some pictures from cleavage, slaty cleavage. Even if they got the microscope, the microscope was not really powerful enough to, um, to see the details of a cleavage. This is a picture of a cleavage, slaty cleavage. We know that these, this cleavage, we know today, that forms by rotation of mineral grains, forms by pressure solution along these dark bands here, there's pressure solution. Uh, precipitation maybe in pressure shadows, maybe precipitation here and here. And maybe also some straining of these grains, some flattening of these grains. So several mechanisms. Just a couple of pictures of uh, cleavage, very nice. Um, and it's quite obvious, especially when you have folds like this, that this cleavage has formed by by shortening parallel to the layering across the cleavage. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, the cleavage was, for, was explored in the 1800s. But I said the microscope was not good enough. The word cleavage means split. I'm sure you have Google cleavage on the, on the internet and you will see what you get. It's, it's a split, it's what it means. Uh, because they thought originally that cleavage was related to micro-fracturing. Okay. At some point, uh, cleavage was also thought to be the result of electric and magnetic forces. Very strange. They had some ideas at some point that were clearly not correct. That's okay. So uh, then some people uh, figured out that maybe there, there seems to be rotation. Sharp noted that fossils seem to have been flattened, pressed together in the slaty cleavage. He made observations and made a, a correct conclusion. Another guy, Sorby, he also at some point suggested that cleavage could form from platy minerals developing perpendicular to the direction of shortening and, and rotation. Okay. Rotation. He did, he did some experiments with clay and gypsum 
and put put oops, put uh, small uh, mineral grains of mica and and some iron oxide, and I noted that they rotate exactly like this animation shows. So uh, again, people at that time who did experiments and made careful observations, they got pretty close to the actual correct answer. But then there were others that did not. What else? Um, I'm spending too much time. But so there were, um, uh, let me jump to this one. So there were, there were actually three different models for how cleavage formed. This left side figure indicates fracture cleavage. It means that there was tension and extension across the cleavage, small fractures, clearly wrong. And this term fracture cleavage shouldn't really be used. I've heard it being used in Brazil actually several times. But it's not a good, it's not a good term to, to use because it's confusing. Cleavage is always involves at least a component of shortening which is the middle one. This uh, idea too that cleavage could also be what they call strain slip cleavage could form uh, like what we see here by like a deck of a card so simple shear and then miraculously the cleavages the cleavage forms parallel to the shear movement. Okay. We already said what cleavage is. So, so there was a lot of, let me go back to this. So on, on the side of the slide here, and you don't get time to, to see all of this, but there is a very long time, this red uh, color indicates there was a very long time that cleavage was discussed and it wasn't resolved until the 19... 60s really when we had the good uh, electron microscope scanning electron microscope TEM that's when we figured out cleavage uh, properly Let's see. then there is strain strain is um, important in structural geology strain I think you call that strain in Portuguese too uh, change in shape is what it actually means. This is a slate uh, from Wales. Uh, these things are reduction spots. And you can see that they are elliptical. If you use your imagination looking at these three different sections. And these were early, these were used at an early time to uh, say something about um, you see, we don't have to, to worry about the names. Autumn. Oh my goodness, here we go. He, he used these as, and understood that these had been deformed from uh, spheres, which is how reduction uh, spots usually form. There's some discussion about this, but we'll let that uh, alone for now. That there is actually a shortening perpendicular to the cleavage. And then he defined two other axes in different directions. So, okay, so this was in 1856. That's when kind of strain probably was born in the, in the sense that we know strain today. Using markers in rocks and saying something about the deformation based on the shapes of these markers and the inferred original shape. You have to use your imagination it's the final product of deformation that we can see unless we do experiments on numerical models. In rocks, it's always the final strain in this case that we see. And we don't know exactly how it formed. But we can see there is finite shortening across this. In 1885, there's another important uh, paper on uh, these kind of things where the finite strain ellipse was, uh, was uh, um, described <clears throat> also in mathematical way terms. Uh, so it was really 
a good paper on, on strain from 1885. Volume change, formation of even cleavage refraction was discussed. Um, John Ramsey, who is a famous, probably still a structural geologist, he always says that we have to go back to these papers and read them and learn because people have been reinventing the wheel to a large extent. And it's probably true to some extent. Okay. Yeah, let's just jump to this. So the strain ellipse, so that's, we're talking about something like this. This is for uh, actually for a plane strain. That's where you have two uh, planes, circular planes of no finite strain along those sections. Uh, so, um, yes, Harker in 1885 dealt with these things, discussed these things, but, but it, there, it wasn't really completely um, up to modern standards. Uh, Derek Flynn Derek Flynn, there he is, he's a little shy. Well, he's actually not shy at all. Um, Derek Flynn did, made something called the Flynn diagram. This is a British geologist. Um, he called it deformation diagram. Around 1960, where you can graphically uh, represent the shape of the strain ellipsoid, okay? So, so we had, you know this diagram. Uh, long axis over the intermediate axis of the strain ellipse, x over y, and then y over z or z, uh, the intermediate over the short axis, strain axis. With plane strain plotting along this line, the diagonal, simple shear, pure shear, and kind of cigars, if you like, up there, pancakes, hamburgers maybe, down here, so you remember. So this diagram was very useful. It shows in one diagram the shape of the strain ellipsoid in three dimensions. It doesn't say anything about the orientation. Uh, this long axis could very well be horizontal or any other direction, any other orientation. It's just the geometry. Now there's logarithmic, that is logarithmic actually, okay. And people started to look at fabrics in rocks, you know, where you have uh, rocks with very strong lineation, rocks with very strong kind of no lineation, a strong, they interpret that as flattening, S-tectonite, L-tectonite, so using indirectly the Flynn diagram. Now this is in the 60s and 70s, we are now in terms of strain. There's a, there was a lot of methods developed in the 60s and 70s. Don't have to, to read them all, but uh, different ways that you can calculate strain. Before that, people would take one pebble, for example, from a conglomerate, try to dig it out and say, this is the strain ellipsoid. ellipsoid. Um, then people got more sophisticated using uh, computers and looking at sections and doing statistics. So that was going on in the 60s and 70s. Um, <clears throat> these programs were a little bit hard to use in the 80s and 90s, I found. No, there are some very good programs, easy to use. The best one, if you're interested in this, is made by Fred Volmer, so if you Google his name, you find a strain program that is very easy to use. And it gives you, uh, yeah, it just does whatever you want. So that's a little bit about strain. It was very big in the 70s. Thrusting is an important thing in structural geology. Uh, thrust faults, thrust naps. This is uh, something that goes back quite some time, back to the late 1800s. Could, could enormous masses of rocks be 
transported laterally, horizontally for hundreds of kilometers. Is it really possible? And this is very nice because it, this idea grew out of field observations. There was no reason, they had no reason why big pieces of a crust should move 200 kilometers. They were talking about numbers like that. There's no reason why that should happen. We didn't have plate tectonics. But they made observations and reached these conclusions. Couldn't explain why. In Scotland, Northern Scotland, in the Scandinavian Caldonides, in the Alps, and thrust was first defined in a nature paper from 1884. So this is back in the pioneer times. And this, just to illustrate, I mean, it was difficult for these people. This is a cross section, a little bit of a three dimensional touch to it. Cross section across part of the Alps. And there's this red unit overlaying the yellow and blue. And they were into folding. Folding was the thing at the time. And they bent this contact back because these rocks were older than the ones underneath. And they bent this back. They made some incredible folds. Look at this here. Very big folds. But the correct interpretation is thrusting. And there was actually a young French geologist, Bertrand, who um, looked at these maps and profiles, very smart. And he figured out, without having been even in the field, which is a bad thing, but he was smart enough to figure out that this was actually a thrust that was connected over like this. This is the glorious thrust in Switzerland. Uh, this is what it looks like in Switzerland, just to show you. Very planar, there's uh, younger rocks at the bottom, Perm Cretaceous and younger, and Permian rocks on top. Okay. And then this beautiful thrust, very sharp, separating these two different parts of the world. Young, old. Let's jump to this one. And this is an important thing. This is why they needed thrusts, because they had uh, older rocks on top of younger rocks. Okay. This, was, this is in, in Montana, where we have pre, the Lewis thrust pre-Cambrian on top of Cretaceous. This is in Scotland, where we have Lewisian pre-Cambrian, Archaean, is it? Very old. And then Cambrian, and then basement, Lewisian again. So they had to explain these things. So it's, it's um, old and young. We can turn that around to make it, this is a thrust here. Okay. Very important observations that led them to the right conclusion without really having an explanation. Before, well, at the same time, there were people saying, now we don't believe in this. We do not believe that you can have these thrust naps. And some people said, yes, I think there has to be thrust naps. And then a couple of years later, they changed their mind, so there was back and forth. This is a cross section across the Caledonides in Norway, where they are, there are thrusts, but it was interpreted as folding. I don't know if you can see this. This is the geosyncline model before plate tectonics. And it was very much about folding. There was not much room for big thrusts. But people, so there was a, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, this is a picture I found on the internet, <coughs> uh, YouTube, where the geosyncline is explained in detail. I have no idea why they do that in 2016, but this, this was left in, uh, in, uh, in the mid 60s. The controversy, the concept of thrusting. There is two problems with thrusting that these people faced. One, how is it possible mechanically? When if you push a thrust nap, you should you should just break the thrust nap here instead of moving the whole thing. Why does the whole thrust nap move? 
Well, it has to do with this zone, the thrust, and the nature of the rheology of that thrust. There was a very important paper in uh, 1959 by Hubbard and Ruby, who suggested that there has to be fluids, overpressured fluids uh, within the thrust, that the nap sort of like a hovercraft. You know what a hovercraft is? So it kind of flows on this fluid, overpressured. And there is this beer can experiment that I actually never did, but if you take a beer can or something like that, put it on a glass wall, you can turn that glass wall up to something like 27 degrees before this bear can starts to slide. If you take a bear can out of the freezer, very cold, and do the same thing, the bear can will slide at as little as one degree because it's cold and it's, there is water uh, condensing uh, around it at the bottom. And because of this water, this fluid, it, it just slides. So what's going on here? The weak, overpressured nature of this is important. The other thing, I think that was Elliot who, who's pointed that out, the thrust doesn't move everywhere at the same time. It's not like the whole thrust sheet moves everything at the same time. It moves in bits and pieces, a little bit here and a little bit there. A little bit like this guy, Caterpillar. It moves, it lags here, and then it moves back, and, you know, and, it, and it, makes, it makes progress. That was the other explanation. So they kind of got around that problem. And what could drive thrusting is, of course, plate tectonics. Here's another kind of experiment, thrust naps. So you need to have some very weak layer, uh, cream, some kind of vanilla, something like that, and then you can thrust things very easily. And sometimes you don't want that. You carry a cake, right? And you, you do a little bit too much you, like that, and the, and the top of the cake starts sliding. And it's also, that's, okay, that's extensional tectonics, but it's the same thing. So modern thrust tectonics was established in the 60s. Actually, this, this discussion was going on far into the 19th century. 1940, 50, some people were still arguing this was not possible. And modern thrust tectonics, Canadian Rockies was important, and this guy, Dahlstrom, did a lot of work, and some other people, and they restored and balanced cross sections that they made. Now this, this is kind of uh, stuff that they did. Um, ideas about how thrust sheets form and different, different models. And another thing came up, the model of the critical wedge. So critical wedge theory. Davis, uh, Suppy and Dahlen Elliot Platt in 1986, they, they, they were looking at this thing, pushing a wedge of, uh, of, of thrust naps over a decollement, and, and how the friction along this decollement, the strength of this material, and the erosion would influence, would kind of define the, the shape of this wedge. Well, it's a little, maybe a little bit complicated, I'm not going to explain more about that, but it was an important um, discussion. This was in the 60s and 70s, I guess it was in the 70s and 80s, This exactly this thing. So this wedge of accreted material, thrust naps and things, they could also, of course, uh, we, we saw this model a little while ago, could also uh, model. This is exactly what's going on. There's the detachment, the decollement at the bottom, and you form this wedge sloping toward the foreland, growing, but it keeps its shape, more or less, unless something happens. It's a numerical model of the same thing. 
This is Taiwan, uh, the organic wedge. And this is a sand model producing these kind of structures. Okay. So that's, that's the thrust thing. Everybody was happy when the plate tectonics came and thrusting was made sense. <clears throat> this guy, he was a sander, Bruno Sander. He's very, very famous in structural geology. He was very famous, I should say. In, uh, after he published a book in 1930, and this book was translated to English in 1956, I don't know, maybe later. He talked about symmetry axis, kinematic axis. The problem was that he didn't understand what was going on during deformation. He had A, B, and C is not so important. Um, B was parallel to the lineation, A perpendicular, parallel to the foliation. And he thought this was kind of the ultimate thing that could explain deformation. Uh, so in 1930 and onward. And he made a mess of all of this. This is, this is the time of confusion that I was talking about. I shouldn't say that. I mean, this is, it's good, it's science. You have to try things. It's not, I don't want to criticize him. That's not what I mean to do. But it ended, people ended up thinking that the lineation is perpendicular to the shear or transport direction. So if you shear something, the lineation would form perpendicular to the shear direction. That's not how it usually happens. Um, well, I'm not going to explain all of this, but Flynn, we already talked about Flynn, Derek Flynn. He, uh, he showed that fold axes can have any, fold axes and lineations actually can have different angles to the movement directions. And he actually argued that Sanders' axis should be abandoned and replaced by the strain ellipsoid in tectonics. So the strain ellipsoid. We don't need Sanders' kinematic axis anymore. This was 30 years after Sanders introduced this confusion. So 30 years of confusion. Um, just, just to show how this was important, this is Scotland, 50 kilometers. So it's only 50, unless, yeah, maybe. Um, this is the Moyne thrust, the basement. And these are the lineations, and they make a high angle to the thrust. And we know today that the thrusting was more or less parallel to these lineations. Top to the northwest. But so there was a big discussion because of Sander and his axis, whether the thrusting was in this direction or in that direction. It's a little bit strange, but there was a lot of discussion. The first people who mapped there, um, let me see. Uh, this was the British survey people in the late 18, hundreds and early 1900s, they got it right. They, they understood that the thrusting had to be parallel to the lineation. But then later there was uh, all this discussion and theoretical considerations that confused things completely until all the way, uh, until there was, there was a meeting in, I wasn't there, I wasn't born, but there was a meeting in London, the Geological Society of London in 1960, where this was still being discussed between the different parties. It's not that long ago. It's a very simple thing. Okay. Folds and folding. We're back to folds and folding. We talked about folding uh, in the early experiments. Um, let me see. So, so um, describing the geometry of the folds, you know, tightness, curvature, change in thickness, all these kind of things also started back in the late 1800s. Von Hesse, Von Hesse distinguished folds with constant layer thickness, 
from uh, those showing evidence of limb thinning, which is what was called similar folds. This is what John Ramsey was doing more of um, much later. So that's, um, and then there's a classical book by a guy called Brusk in 1929, uh, where he showed how you can construct fold geometries based on constant thickness, constant orthogonal thickness. So you have some information from the surface and maybe a well or two. You can use that information to draw, you know, bedding um, and draw a sketch up the fold based on the assumption that the thickness is always the same, which is of course not true, but it's uh, you can, at least you can do that, very popular. Uh, in 1964, we got this classification that you probably know, upright, vertical, recumbent folds, dip of the axial plane, dip of the fold hinge. And then John Ramsey took this uh, farther in the 60s. I'm just gonna to refer to this diagram different classes of folds based on how the thickness of the limbs vary. And then parallel folds, similar folds, and so on. And we, we've seen something like this before. John Suppy was a guy who, um, who made these constructions, mathematical constructions of folds related to thrusting. This was in the 70s. Like I said, there was a lot of things going on in the 60s and 70s. It was one of his constructions. And then mechanical analysis. Mechanical analysis means that you consider the, the mechanical properties of the different layers, the viscosity, and then you can, uh, you can uh, find relationships between, let me see here, Viscosity and geometry, wavelength, uh, amplitude, and so on. Which is interesting because you can try to extract viscosity from folded rocks. Okay, uh, okay uh, today I can, I can go over there. There is numerical modeling of folds. You can do folding on the computer, but it's a little bit difficult. And this is uh, an ongoing research field. Not so many people are involved, but there are some. So this is from the 60s and up. Okay, not done yet. Um, <clears throat> this thing about progressive deformation is, is not, it has, actually has been there all the time, but there was a focus on progressive deformation in the 60s and on onwards. We have to think about deformation in terms of history, in terms of a dynamic and progressive way. And you must, many people use D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, and so on, uh, when they map areas especially in, in, uh, uh, in the fold belts and in, in Brazil and other places like, like uh, the Brasiliano belts. Um, and this was uh, probably a good thing that Sander introduced in the 30s. And it was the standard to use, still is in some places. And the idea is that the stress and terrain fields are constant over a given geologic time interval. And then they change to some other orientation and you get new structures with different orientations. But this, you have to be a little bit careful with this. Because, I mean, you, people often look at the structural style or expression and correlate, the, you know, the folds look similar in one outcrop, in another outcrop. But this may not be 
the case. They may not have formed at the same time or during the same deformation. Um, uh, deformation phases may be caused by local geometric effects. I'm going to show what I mean by that. Okay, let me just jump to this. So here we have um, foliated rock, maybe a myelinite, myelinitic foliation, and we get a little bump, a little bend in the foliation locally. And what happens is that this bend amplifies to become a fold, tighter fold. And this foliation, the green line is being folded, and we can form a new foliation. Okay, so this can develop. So if this is a myelinitic foliation, this would be SM plus 1. You could call this whatever you want, S2 and S3. And then the same thing happens again. And this time the first fold is folded again. It looks like a very complicated, polyphasally deformed um, rock or area. But it's not. It's, these are things that can happen when rocks are being sheared uh, anywhere at any time during the shearing. These are not D1, D2, D3 and so on. These are just very local complications. And, and people in the 60s came up with a lot of D1, D2, D3, and so on, by counting these things. Um, <clears throat> so this was this got clear in the 80s. And there's something called sheath folds. This this is um, uh, the cobbled, they were cobbled in in Rennes, where they made some experiments producing sheath folds just during simple shear because there were regular irregularities and these irregularities amplified and and you can form this kind of geometry and this if you make a section through a fold like this you will see something like this okay looks like an interference pattern where you have two uh, different phases of folding but they form can form during one phase of, of, of shearing. So this was an important thing that people pointed out in the 80s, early 80s, late 90s, 70s. When you see these kind of basin and dome interference structures, maybe they formed during one deformation. We don't have to have two deformations. It may be, but we don't know. Some other examples of local formation of cleavage and fabric that you shouldn't call D1, D2, D3, and so on. Okay. The first one, this is a rigid object. And when you have shear like this, this was pointed out also in the 80s, I guess. You can, you get uh, folding on this side, thinning on that side, and the opposite here. There's a drawing from the field where you get thinning of the high strain zone here, and then you it opens up and you get folding on this side. This actually is, tells your sense of shear. But it's, don't start to call this S1, S2, and so on, because these are structures that form uh, continuously in shear zones, if this is a shear zone. And uh, they all have different ages, basically. Another example is uh, SC structures, myelonites, where you get two foliations, two sets of planar structure forming, and uh, maybe even three, all during one simple shear deformation. So maybe it's tempting to, to, look, to, to call this a, a secondary cleavage, and, and, but, it, but it's, of course it is, but it's not a secondary. It's not a different phase of deformation. It's the same phase of deformation. Myelonites and fault rocks. Uh, cool stuff. Uh, shear sounds and myelonites. Uh, let me see. 
skip a little bit. Um, there was a guy called Lapworth, a British guy, geological survey of Britain, who described uh, myelinites or fault rocks along the Moyne thrust zone. It's the first description of uh, myelinites. And he described these myelinites as well foliated rocks, no, no brittle deformation. Very good descriptions. Again, field work. If you do good field work, make good observations, you are likely to end up with something, something that is, is good, is uh, good science. Uh, so he defined myelinites, and then there was a couple of guys who defined cataclasite in 1924 as something different, non-foliated. So this was all good in the early 20s. Then, of course, there's always someone who comes and, um, and, and, and mess up things. And this was Waters and Campbell in 1935, 10 years later. And they said any kind of fault or shear zone rock can be called a cataclastic rock. So they just blurred this difference between myelinites and cataclasites. And there was a terrible paper by Higgins in 1971 where, where he stated that myelinites are cataclastic. Myelinites are not cataclastic. Myelinites are formed by plastic, crystal plastic deformation. And this is, we, we, we understood that in the 70s by means of the electron microscope and, uh, and, and, and TEM. And uh, let me see, so um, let me skip to, jump to Sibson in 1977. That was eight, six years later. He presented the classification that is mostly used today, more or less. Faults are, are cataclastic fault rocks are deformed by brittle deformation and myelinetic rocks by crystal plastic deformation mechanisms. And this is the, the classification scheme that you probably have seen. Non-foliated, foliated. So the fol all the myelinites are foliated. Most of the cataclasites and brexures are non-foliated. There is, I had to introduce this foliated gauge term at some point, but that's more or less the classification we use today. Again, it took all until 1977 to really uh, get a good classification and understanding of what a myelinite and a cataclasite is. Myelinization is, is very interesting and, oops. Uh, for example, if we have a, a magmatic rock like this one with uh, some feldspar objects, we can look at uh, what happens as it gets deformed. This is just a uh, diagram, uh, gamma, shear strain, increasing to the right. And uh, as we deform this uh, rock, we see the um, feldspar the crisps being uh, dragged out more and more, more and more, um, until it's really difficult to tell what they originally were. This is just walking a few meters to, into this, this monument. And you get really high strains. This is from the Hibera belt. Um, don't remember, close to the boundary between uh, Rio de Janeiro and Minas Gerais, I think. You get really, really, really um, uh, highly deformed, stretched uh, myelinites. Well, it's impossible to tell exactly what, what it was in the first place, originally. Okay. So simple shear. Shear sounds. I'll talk more about that on um, Friday, I guess. <clears throat> well, they were really de defined in a mathematical way, a rigorous way, and by Ramsey and Graham in 1970, where they said that you can have simple shear and maybe compaction across it, 
they call it dilation. And that's, uh, that's an easy deformation to deal with. And uh, simple shear zones like this, you have the strain ellipse that increases as, as the shear strain increases. I've illustrated that here. The angle between the strain, the foliation of the strain ellipse and the shear zone decreases. And there was a lot of things that they can, could easily describe in terms of simple mathematics. Shear zone, we'll, we'll get back to this, we don't have to spend time on that. An incremental deformation was popular in the 70s. You had a little bit of deformation, you get a new ellipse, a new ellipse, a new ellipse. And then people started to talk about more complicated shear zones, more general shear zones. And this is a network of shear zones that you probably recognize from the northeast. Patos is in here. And um, they, they, they deviate from simple shear. So people were starting to think about that. We'll get back to that. Um, sense of shear, um, which you probably know, it's Actually, let me just skip to this. It's all about asymmetry, asymmetric structures, different kinds of asymmetric structures. Uh, these are sym symmetric structures on the right that indicate maybe coaxial deformation and non-coaxial deformation to the left with a sense of shear that you can extract from asymmetry. It's a long list of, of, of criteria. This is SC structures. This one is from uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro. This is um, from France. Um, things rotate like this with the formation of shear bands. We get these different porphyroclasts, uh, delta, uh, sigma and delta. And this was a very useful tool. This was all and developed over a few years, around 1980, 1979 to 1984. It was five years where this was really spelled out sufficiently that people could use the, this criteria. Okay. So by using these criteria, people went back to the field with these things in their minds, and they observed the sense of shear many places, and they got some surprises. And metamorphic core complex were discovered based on, on this to a large extent in the basin and range. A lot of extension in the basin and range was confirmed by these sense of shear indicators. Extensional shear zones in the Himalayas were discovered thanks to kinematic indicators. Very important observations um, in the 80s and later. Extensional collapse of mountain chains. Um, this is um, metamorphic core complex, which can form in different ways. This is the uh, poor figure from the an, an old paper by R Brian Wernicke and uh, Birch Field from 1981. You form a detachment and lots of extensional faults in the upper plate and myelinites along this detachment. Metamorphic core complexes in the western US. All this was discovered because of, um, of kinematic indicators being understood. Um, the previous professor was talking about, so he just showed a, a figure like this of the Caledonian origin, Appalachian origin down here. And this is, I actually did my PhD there, this, um, because I live there. Uh, this is um, different colors, these different colors indicate different Caledonian naps. Uh, these naps were thrust, you can restore it, put them back, and then they were thrust and put to the east. And so we had thrusting, uh, people agreed that there was thrusting going on. Uh, this is a different interpretation, just similar things. And every myelonite zone in this origin were interpreted as a thrust. 
everything was interpreted due to thrusting because we find they finally figured out that thrusting was going on. It took many decades to figure that out. And then when we looked at the kinematics, it looked like the kinematics were pointing in the wrong direction. They were not indicating thrusting, but mostly um, extension movement in the wrong direction, let me see. So very, in very simple terms, um, the, the Caledonian apps were pushed to the east. Um, the pushing ended and they were sliding back to the west. So you get reactivation of the thrusts to form extensional shear zones. And it didn't stop there. You also got some very impressive shear zones that cut through the entire crust. This, everybody was thinking this was it until we looked at the kinematic indicators. Uh, and then we found that there is more to this history. So it's more like this, two continents, uh, Baltica, Laurentia, Baltica being subducted. And then there was reversal of kinematics during this extensional history. Let's do that again. So subduction, oceanic crust, uh, the continent becomes subduction to uh, subducted. Now the, this is a thrust becomes reactivated. And you can make these models based on kinematic observations in the field. So this is maybe the most important thing that happened to pure structural geology in the 80s. Okay, let me see here. I'm going to, um, well, let me just say, we don't want to go on forever. Um, then there was also in the 80s, 70s and 80s were fun. In the 80s, there was a focus on from incremental strain, which is increments to the continuous flow pattern. What's going on at any moment in deforming rocks and things like flow apophysis and this gets a little bit complicated the way that particles move in deformed rocks can be modeled and what's called instantaneous stretching axes were defined and i'm not going to talk much about this now but this flow theory was developed in the 80s which formed a very important basis for further computer uh, modeling of deformation. Um, yeah, I'll talk about this. Uh, 3D deformation. Just a little taste. We already talked about Derek Flynn. He um, introduced his Flynn plot, where you can actually um, plot the strain ellipsoid. And just to remind you, there's uniaxial strain where things move only in one direction. There is plane strain where things move in two directions. That means in one plane. And then you have shortening in one direction and extension in another direction. And nothing going on in the third direction in terms of uh, the, the strain axis. And then you have three-dimensional strain, right? So, which you can have the two extremes, uniform extension and uniform flattening. Pancakes to the right and uh, kind of cigars to the left. So we, we talked about that a little bit. And, and this guy, Derek Flynn, he, he was very, he died just a few years ago. He actually criticized me and, and Kes Passier, I remember in the paper, uh, claiming that we were too, uh, too plain strain, which is true. But I've done other things, that, which is 3D too, so I feel okay. Um, um, he saw, he went around and measured strain. Again, field observations, important. And he found that it's, in general, the strain ellipsoid does not confirm to um, plain strain. It's usually... Uh, Usually the strain kind of uh, 
plots for that. Oh shit. We have we have to start over again. It's not gonna take one and a half hours. Okay. I mean let me see if we are here. Okay. Usually the, the strain data plots away from this line. So there's a lot of things we have to um, investigate in terms of 3D strain, and it's a little bit difficult three-dimensional strain because there are so many ways that you can create any given strain, a three-dimensional strain here, where all the three axes, X, Y, and Z, have, have been extended or shortened. And this, this is a very simple model that um, was introduced by Sanderson and Marchini in 1984, and I explored that with Basil Tickoff uh, in the early 90s. And, uh, and it's transgression. So you have shear, simple shear in the horizontal direction, but you also squeeze material up at the same time. And just by doing that, you create a fairly complicated situation with many interesting effects. Delineation is now oblique to the shear plane in a different way, and I'm not going to go into that, but even this simple model is, is complicated. Another thing that um, was popular in the 80s was strain partitioning, which happens on many scales. Uh, for example, uh, plate boundary scale. So, so we have uh, this oceanic crust moving down, pushing against this, but in an oblique way. And the result is you get a little bit of simple shear along this fault, or shear zone. At the same time, you get shortening down here, the thrust and folding form. So you, so you are splitting the deformation into two components that sum up to the boundary conditions that we have. Strain partitioning, I'm not going to say more about that. And then this, this is really, it's another uh, interesting thing, crystallographically preferred orientation patterns, P, uh, CPO. They were, people were destroying their eyes in the 50s and 60s and making these kind of diagrams using the U-stage, oops, using the U-stage, still, uh, and a microscope creating patterns. But they were, again, confused by Sanders' kinematic axis and theory. So um, there was a lot of wasted work trying to find out the distribution of quartz C-axis um, in, in a deformed rock in the 40s, 50s, uh, 60s. Okay, um, then we got the, the SEM and TEM, and we knew what was going on, and we could... Let us jump to... Please don't go to the front. Okay. We could... We, we got something called EBSD. Uh, which is an instrument um, attached to the SEM, automatic backscatter diffraction, where you can actually map the grains in a completely different way. So this is a thin section. Now, these are different minerals. There's uh, feldspar, garnet, and it's very difficult to distinguish between feldspar and quartz in the matrix. But the EBSD mapping can give you a map of the different mineral phases and their crystallographic orientation, which is indexed by different colors here. And there's many things you can easily plot for C axis and other axis, plot to place 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and grain size distribution. There's a lot of things that you can do with the EBSD uh, that is very interesting. So this is, there was just a meeting in the US about Future, the future of, of structural geology, 
And this was one of the methods that was was uh, people agreed would be important in the future. Let's see. And we already said, and I'm, but I want to quote a guy called um, De Sitter. He wrote a textbook. In this textbook, I found this quote. In all my descriptions of deformations of the Earth's crust, I have avoided mention of the origin of the forces that caused these deformations. Because we are still completely in the dark about these causes. We don't know what caused, they didn't know what caused deformation. This was in 1956. It's a black box. But then came plate tectonics and everything almost, not everything, but most things could be explained in a relatively simple way, at least to the first, the first order with margins, plate margins, uh, all kinds of things going on. So that's incredibly important. Okay, so we have some, I have to say something about brittle faults too, because in the 1980s, I would say, and later, maybe the 90s uh, is even more important our understanding of faulting has completely exploded. And much of that is thanks to 3D seismic, which oil companies collect a lot of. Okay. This guy, Alan Gibbs, he was giving classes around the world, more or less, when I was a student. Uh, and he had this idea that there is a relationship between uh, the, the geometry of the faults and, and, and the uh, layering and the folding and deformation of, of the, the hanging wall. And he, he was uh, inspired by thrust tectonics in the Rockies and other places. And he made many of the same structures on his sections. Uh, at the time, people who interpreted rifts they used the rulers to draw the faults, completely straight lines. This guy went to the other extreme and made them listric as where he could. And uh, let's see, he introduced things like uh, extensional duplexes, just like in thrust tectonics. He's, he's a very fun guy, I like him. And, and, and it was too much, it was a little bit too extreme, so he got criticized, but it, it was a very important contribution. Today we are kind of in the middle, we know that uh, there is a large specter of, of, of geometries and faults. Very interesting period. Okay. And then there is uh, waters and the waters and fault model. It's also very important. Uh, Watterson and, and John Walsh, uh, Irish man, um, had this uh, came up with this model that a fault is is a surface or has a surface where the um, displacement increases towards the center of the fault in a kind of a radial way like this. So these lines here are displacement contours maybe 50 meters, 100 meters, 150 meters, and 200 meters near the center. And um, this is how we could, can map faults now with seismic data, measuring the displacement at various points along the fault, and make a map. This map here is, a, is this fault looking straight into the fault plane, so it's basically this thing here from real data. And oftentimes they discovered that there were more than one maximum. So there, in this case, there is two maxima, one there and one there. And then you can, you can make displacement diagrams like that across these. And then people started thinking, oh, so these two faults must have been individual faults to start with and then 
they grew together and uh, formed um, as continuous faults um, <clears throat> that was much longer with two maxima like that. Let me see. So this 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 uh, leads us into fault fault growth and the evolution of fault networks. Um, the longer the fault is, the more displacement it has in general. Okay, long faults have large displacements, large offsets. Small faults have small offsets, and this they have to, they grow, but they figure that the way many faults grow is exactly what we were talking about. They form a small individual uh, faults, and then they connect, link up, and form much longer faults. So it's not like the fault grows and grows and grows and grows and grows like that. There are different segments that link up, and all of a sudden, they are much longer. You can do experiments on this. Okay. Let's see. Okay. This is a, this is a video. This is also a plaster. Now we are looking at this from the top. Let me see. It's it's quite quite nice. Where is this thing? Ah, oh, okay. So I'm going to run this. See what happens. We are pulling this wall, forming faults, uh, segments that link up. and form continuous folds, and then we are performing segments here too. Let's see, let's see what's going on here. Let's just stop it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, a little bit more. It's not so easy to see, but there, there is a small, small fault segment here, and a segment here, a segment here, different segments, and because they are not completely aligned, they, um, they, they, they um, end up forming non-planar fault. Look at this zigzag geometry. This zigzag geometry is formed by linking up of, of individual small faults. Again, simple experiments can help us understand faults too. This was from a master's thesis in uh, Norway, Bergen. This is the way the student, she, she analyzed different stages and she found the different faults. I mean, this is what we see I mean, as an end product in a rift, for example. And then we have to understand, okay, we can see the geometry is a little bit zigzag, so we know there has been um, segments growing together. In an experiment, we can map the time of activity for different faults. So it's a dynamic, continuous process. And this is how people are thinking about faults and fault populations today. These faults have different properties along strike that can be important to petroleum exploration and exploitation. And you can do the same thing with numerical models. I'm not going to show that, but you can do exactly the same thing. And we're trying to understand so this you can you can see from this it's a nice figure by Wibbly and Shipton how a fault is composed of many small elements and segments. So there's work being done on this over the last twenty years. I will uh, I will um, okay I will uh, just skip this. Um, I, was, I was skipping the restoration, you understand that. Another thing that was big in the seventh, late 70s and 80s, 1980s, I guess, was finding, determining paleo stress from fault populations. So there was, Australia was the big guy there, 
that people went out, now they could actually measure faults, and striations, and maybe even offsets, put them into a program, and calculate the stress or strain uh, field, which was also a big step ahead. Many, many things happening in the 70s and 80s. Then the digital world, I'm getting close to the end. Today, I mean, it's a, it's a really big step to be able to use your iPhone, measure um, structures very fast, and immediately seeing um, strike and dip and, and things on uh, Google Earth or, or a satellite image or a geologic map. Um, in, in four days, I measured almost a thousand measurements a little while ago with my iPhone. It's incredible. So the digital mapping era is certainly here. Uh, very fast. You can see the stereo net, the equal area, projection. Uh, and this, uh, this is the, the program called Field Move is maybe now the, the, the best one. It's actually made by, by Gibbs uh, company, the guy who made the Listrick Faults interpretation in the 80s. And digital maps, satellite images, uh, Google Earth. Okay, we're almost done. It's very, it's very important. So if you haven't started to use your iPhone, together with your, your, your traditional compass, because you have to check from time to time. And you should do that. And uh, iPad, and, and, and it's, it's no very easy to use for field mapping. It's very fun. Okay. So we're getting close to um, a summary here. Things to be aware of. John Ramsey, I mentioned him before, he wrote a little uh, thing about you know looking back at structural geology and looking ahead and he made this point that we need to basically do field work base our research on sound field observations and this is one of the most important things that I want to uh, communicate is the importance of actually looking at the rocks not being too influenced by your models and anticipations, but just describe, make sketches, and then you can think from that. It's a snap field trip last, last year in Victoria. Victoria. Um, mathematical analysis and numerical modeling will be important, but we need to, it's our job as geologists to make sure that these guys who tweak and twist these numbers in their computers do sensible things. There needs to be a connection with reality. Uh, we need, Ramsey also pointed out that we need to be aware that our subject is three-dimensional. Everything is three-dimensional. Um, thinking plain strain is great. These are great um, reference deformations and we have these reference things but they're in the real world it's more complicated and um, we need to understand that we observe finite strain we observe the end of a deformation history this is the flynn diagram we don't know how we arrived at this strain which in this case is plain strain Maybe the strain was first flattening, then constriction, and then this is something that uh, we don't know too much about. But we can try to find indications about um, the strain history. So what about the future? Uh, structural geology needs to be well integrated with other disciplines. Material science, rock mechanics, numerical modeling, and uh, radiometric dating is very important, very, very important. It will be more and more important as we find more and more ways of dating deformation indirectly or directly. So this is, is, is an important thing. And numerical modeling too is very important, but they need geologic 
input. We need to be realistic. And eBSD, I mentioned that. And always a strong link to plate tectonics will be important. So make sure you stay tuned to what's going on in plate tectonics. Look for clues in the field. I found this sign. This is a big fold in Canada, the, uh, the Canadian Rockies. Uh, Mount Kidd is the name. Don't um, geometries and patterns may look similar, but their formation may be quite different. So this is, you know, what this is. So this is a cleavage. I was kind of just for fun. They look very similar, but they formed in very different ways. So we have to think a little bit. Oops, I pressed that button again, I guess. So yes, there, there's. I think there's. Um, a uh, fun time ahead, especially in, in Brazil. You have a lot of uh, very exciting rocks and regions that have not been explored to the full extent, uh, not to the same extent as, for example, in, in Britain, of course, where there's too many geologists in Norway, too, for that matter. So it, Brazil is a very important, very, very interesting um, uh, country area for, for structural geology and combined with dating and, and other things so there's a lot of things to be done i think i will stop here i tried to give a kind of a perspective i can give this presentation to whoever wants it because there has been a lot of information that um, has been difficult to to grasp um, so if um, somebody wants to to have a copy, I'm happy to give you, but maybe I can give it to, to some of the organizers and you can distribute uh, to others. Okay, muito obrigado. É, obrigado a todo mundo. We are very glad that you are here. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, we would like to take a picture from of you with our organizational team, if that's possible. É, eu queria agradecer a todo mundo que está aqui. A gente, assim, é muito, muito gratificante ver um auditório tão cheio e ver a semana acontecendo e, e ver outras, todas as palestras com muitas pessoas, todo mundo bem, bem participando. Né? Queria agradecer a toda a equipe por tudo que, por toda a ajuda, que isso não é impossível de fazer só com uma pessoa. Foram várias pessoas que tiveram que trabalhar muito desde o começo do ano para fazer o evento acontecer. Queria falar que os ingressos da festa esgotaram, então, quem não comprou, sinto muito, mas não vai poder, não tem como colocar mais pessoas lá dentro do IGC. É a primeira vez que a gente está fazendo isso, é uma experiência nova, e a gente só tem autorização para um limite de pessoas. É, amanhã... Tem duas palestras muito boas também, então eu queria pedir para todo mundo chegar cedo, porque está sujeito a lotar, e depois que lotar, a gente não vai permitir mais que entre, para não ficar tão tumultuado, igual foi a palestra do Blair hoje. Queria agradecer muito, muito, muito mesmo ao nosso professor querido Fabrício Cachito que está dando essa força para a gente, ajudando em vários aspectos, além da tradução. Então, muito obrigada. Todo mundo perguntar se todo mundo assinou a lista para ninguém sair sem assinar, por favor. Ah, alguém tem alguma dúvida? Quer fazer alguma pergunta para o palestrante? Ninguém? <laughs>
Comentários? So I'm going to be around a little bit for tomorrow and, and Friday. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to talk to any of you about anything geology. So just so that you know. A gente vai sortear uns brindes agora. Because we will sort. Like we, we to choose a number and go live for the audience. She's still taking the. But you know, I forget something. <laughs> I need to, to tell. Eu tinha mais alguma coisa para falar, não tinha? Ou pessoal de mais duas coisinhas que eu esqueci. Uma é que eu vou pedir para todo mundo que está na organização, para a gente tirar uma foto bem bonitona, assim, para vir aqui, para a gente juntar, para tirar essa foto com ele. E a segunda é que quem tem livro aí, quer pedir um autógrafo, essas coisas no livro, é para fazer uma fila que ele vai autografar de todo mundo. E todo mundo que não fez inscrição, se inscreva no site. E mais uma coisa... Comprem minerais, camisas, canecas, martelo, tá tudo à venda aí, vão ajudar o CPG a ficar rico. Wait a minute. A gente vai sortear, só tá esperando todo mundo assinar. Ana Paula. Ana Paula. Ok. Gente, espera aí o sorteio. Vai ter brinde. Fica, vai ter brinde. Talvez bo... Acho que a gente pode dar no preparo. Não, esse, esse. Pode, pode. Antes. Gente, espera o sorteio. Hã? Ai, vou entregar isso aqui. Vai falar no. É. Ana Paula. Qual o número? Cento e vinte e cinco? Não, não é cento e oito, né? Uma de um a cento e sessenta e cinco, uma de um a cento e vinte e cinco. Eu tenho que escolher dois números, entre um e um, 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 um e um. Setenta e nove. Não, a primeira é oitenta Não, a primeira é oitenta e cinco. Oitenta e cinco. Larissa Martins. Aê!
O dia pediu para eles fazerem a fila aqui assim de uma vez, para não virar bagunça depois. Mais um. Oh, tem mais um brinde, peraí. São três brindes. São três brindes, segura a ansiedade aí, ó. Mas é, podia falar o pessoal fazer uma fila.